um, Carlton in the in 1970 after uh, uh, graduate school and three years down at Dartmouth and stayed there in the 70s. Since I left in 1980, uh, I've been in medical psychology and social epidemiology, so I don't know a lot about what's happened either here or in social psychology. So I'm just going to be talking about um, what it was like in the 70s in social psychology here and some of the things that we did that I think are really uh, pretty uh, forward-looking and outstanding. Uh, my Carlton experience as I say, uh, we came and as with all moves, especially to another country, there's a bit of a culture shock when you come. And, um, and there was here too, lots of little habits and things and people did things that we didn't quite understand and we adapt to them. But here, uh, we were here about three weeks or four weeks and <clears throat> The October crisis came, <laughs> and the War Measures Act was imposed. And I would go out and walk the dog at night, and on the street corner, there would be a soldier with a gun. And I'd go back in and tell my wife, Martha, and I'd say, where are we? What have we done? <laughs> what have we gotten into? <laughs> uh, but we adapted. We came to love it. Uh, we may have found a place we loved to live, lots of friends, and adopted a Canadian perspective on the world, and it served us well, and we're really happy with it. And the children, in particular, got a great education, a great viewpoint that was different than near American uh, children the same age. Uh, their multilingualism served them very well, um, and uh, so we're very happy to have been here, and it's always fun to come back. Now, professionally, there were also a couple of uh, initial things. Uh, I'd come into my lecture classes, and my undergraduates would let me know that they weren't terribly happy about being taught by an American professor. Um, and I can understand that. I wasn't very happy about what America was doing at the time either. Uh, and uh, it took a while, though, for me to adopt Canadian viewpoint and Canadian ways. And once I did that, then, then they tended to accept me. But professionally and long term, uh, the whole experience here served me very well and gave me lots of good experience. Um, the atmosphere in the 70s was really good. There was a lot of camaraderie. There were a lot of social uh, psychologists that we were good friends with. Um, and we could stop by everybody's office, talk, see each other after class. It didn't matter whether or not you were in social. It was all uh, a very close, open kind, uh, at the same time, kind of environment and very accepting. Um, uh, I thought the graduate program had many of the same characteristics and was very supportive of the graduate students and gave them lots of opportunities. They may wish to disagree with me later about that. <laughs> Uh, and I may be remembering from the wrong perspective, but um, there was outside involvement. Uh, it was not seen as an ivory tower. Um, and people recognized that we had something to say to the population as a whole, as well as to other academicians. The primary example of this in my memory is the TV series Parts of the Sum, which we did on social psychology uh, for the CBC, and I understand is supposed to be showing uh, here today. 
Uh, I'm not sure I want to see myself as I looked <laughs> at that time, but. <clears throat> Uh, and the other kind of thing that was different for me at the time, coming from a very uh, Americanized environment, was the international awareness and the international co collaboration. Uh, lots of uh, contact with uh, uh, researchers from other countries that had different points of view, and that was uh, very important. Now, perhaps the, uh, one of the big highlights here uh, of this was uh, the uh, Conference on Soviet and Western Perspectives in Social Psychology that was held here. Uh, then with psychologists, lots of high name, uh, pro high profile psychologists from many countries. And um, the Soviets came, and I was sort of overwhelmed. Uh, it was a very different point of view, a very different uh, uh, lifestyle that they had, and clearly their culture was different. Uh, and for example, I, I didn't understand the questions they asked me after my talk. But luckily, there were some smart people in the audience who were able to answer for me. Um, but um, it opened my eyes that there really are very different ways in the science uh, to, to look at the, the phenomena that we're studying. Now, in the 1970s, social psychology was going through what is known as the, the big crisis of the 70s. And people were very upset and tired of what it had been like in the 50s and 60s. And in the 50s and 60s, it was laboratory methodology. And you came in and you got, went through a deception experiment and you did a very rigorous kinds of things in a lab. <clears throat> um, it wasn't a very realistic view of what people were living like outside. Um, it was a very limited, uh, people were pointing out, it was a very limited cultural perspective, a very limited temporal perspective, and people didn't really realize to the extent they should have how social life changes across time, how science changes social life and cha social and, and the history and the cultural change, change uh, social behavior. Um, but, and, and as I say, things like that the, the Russians lived a very different life. It wasn't really recognized in mainstream social psychology. And it was an emphasis in their conceptualization on people as passive responders that you went in and you gave them a manipulation in this lab and they responded to it, that, that's it. But in fact, in real social life, it's much more dynamic and people are uh, creating, they're, they're getting into feedback loops uh, that are much more uh, uh, dynamic in our view of them as being passive responders was um, perhaps too, too isolated and, and too static. And we also had a sort of a culture that you did analysis of variance and you did designs that analysis of variance could work on. Uh, and if you did something like regression analysis, hey, that's sloppy. You know, uh, but the analysis of variance doesn't really capture um, the dynamic, just like the idea of passive responders doesn't capture the dynamic. And to have these limited number of, of cells with manipulations doesn't 
doesn't capture the world very well either. So there was a crisis at the time, people becoming dissatisfied with this. And one of the highlights of this was a conference held here um, <coughs> with lots of high profile, well-known participants from seven different cultures, countries on the crisis, what the problems are, what the solutions might be, and um, uh, <coughs> where we might be going. Uh, and uh, it was a really astounding, recommend the book still is very interesting, uh, that, uh, that Lloyd uh, Strickland um, uh, edited uh, and uh, really explored these, um, these um, issues in detail. Now, we as social psychologists at the time, um, we're trying to get out of this crisis and do different things. And some of our solutions were only partial solutions. And one of the things we were doing with our students at the time was to get out of the lab, take our lab uh, experiments, um, take our lab findings, and go out there and try the same thing out in the field. And now, that gets out of the lab, gets into the real world, but it still has the same conceptualization of the one uh, stimulus, one response kind of, uh, of theory. But we tried this in lots of different ways. Now, there were lots of, lots of field studies. I won't go into to them all, um, but I do want to highlight one of them, um, and that was there was a, a laboratory finding at the time uh, on severity of initiation into a group and liking of the group. And so in the laboratory, what they would do would be to have one group get access to, to uh, a membership in a group very easily. The other condition you had to pay a lot or work a lot. Sometimes you were shocked with electric shock. All these severe, severe things to get into the group. And then they, after you got into the group and met and so forth, they asked you how much you liked it. And those who underwent the severe initiation liked it more. And dissonance theory said, well, you were rationalizing this. and. Uh, uh, you were, in effect, justifying in, in retrospect. So we tried to take this, and we couldn't take electric shock out into the, the world, but we, we tried this, and there was a, a walk for charity here in Ottawa called the Miles for Millions, and it was a 35-mile uh, charity walk, and you got a pledge, for each mile that you walk. And <coughs> so we went around and at every, every five mile post, we would interview some teenage, 50 teenage participants in, in the walk and <coughs> ask them why they were walking. What's, what's, what's going on here? What's your motivation? And how much do you like it? And so forth. And by the way, <coughs> If you want to see this, it's part of the parts of the sum video that's being shown here. Uh, we, they, parts of the sum went down and, and videotaped that walk. And <coughs> essentially what we found was, here, what are your reasons for marching? As you go through here at the start, and you see that the importance of the charity uh, tends to go up in the walkers' minds as they uh, exert more effort. Um, at least through mile 27. Uh, <laughs> now, we, we, we're faced with this drop at uh, the finish line, 
And there are lots of speculation as to what it is and why it happened. We're not sure. <clears throat> but those of you who go on the walk tomorrow, if someone comes up and interviews you, <clears throat> just, just remember it's for science. <clears throat> uh, but anyway, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, kind of uh, thing, oh, and one might say, oh yeah, well the people who didn't think the, the, the marching was important, they dropped out. But we've checked on that, because one, if it's selective attrition, then you would expect uh, the people who drop out early and people we interviewed at the start to have lower pledges per mile, and they didn't, had the same, same pledge per mile. So, it's unlikely that it's selective attrition. So uh, anyway, we did a lot of these kinds of field studies. Now, it's not a field study, but I think one of the things that was done at the time that was really uh, ahead of its time and really had uh, a lot of importance and foresight was the, uh, the uh, project that we undertook with the Department of Communications called the Wired City. And the Wired City, this is back in the 70s, we did, and the Wired City looked at telecommunication, teleconferencing, and what the imposition of this media did to interaction and to decision making. And in the Wired City, uh, people uh, would sit in front of this and there were four TV screens and uh, you got yourself filmed and you could interact with four other people. Um, and we would do problem solving uh, uh, task and to see to the extent to which uh, just doing it over uh, teleconferencing uh, over media changed what happened compared to face to face. Uh, and I'll just take you through a couple of studies uh, that we did there. Um, one was we had groups meet four sessions, either groups that met face-to-face -face four different times or had teleconferences four different times and solved problems. And um, one of the things we looked at was the extent to which uh, leadership uh, uh, tended to form and leadership hierarchies tended to form. And here, face to face, what you found was that the, as you had often found uh, in this past research, that the people who dominated the talk were seen as having the best ideas and were people saying, yeah, I'd like to work with this person again, and uh, had seen as having the most idea quantity and the people who sat there and didn't say much, didn't get rated very high. Mediated condition, nothing. No leadership hierarchies developed effectively. The interpersonal contact, the interpersonal presence was not um, strong enough to build this kind of inner group uh, bonding. Now, another thing, and this is something we had gotten from uh, laboratory research, is that <clears throat> intense personal group interaction is probably less efficient if you've got an easy problem because the people get involved and they get their personal life going and 
all sorts of things get in the way of talking about it. If you get an easy problem, then they get it over quickly. If you got a hard problem, you need to explore to find new solutions. So we gave people in teleconferencing and face-to-face -face hard problems to solve. And it was one foreman trying to change the work pattern of three workers who didn't want to change. And let's see the kinds of solutions they had. In face-to-face, -face, they had simple solutions, and that is one, either the foreman or the group one, compromise solutions, things like that alternate, or they come up with a completely new idea that solved the problem. Do it over the teleconference, they were all faced, I mean, they were all simple solutions, or mainly simple solutions. So effectively for hard problems, on me, teleconferencing, as it's done today, over the internet, whatever, you don't get the same kind of interpersonal contact, uh, interpersonal force, and uh, <clears throat> your solutions may not be as good. You extend this to, I know people are doing a lot of research on this, and they're doing stuff on things like, what is it now that everybody's forming friendships over Facebook? That's not even as much interaction as teleconferencing. So I think things like the Wide City were very um, um, early, good research that really hadn't been attended to very well. And there are other things, too. Now I find that perhaps at least a lot of the research I've seen has left the lab theory-based and is out there just searching randomly through data. And it needs to go back and have some of the uh, um, uh, principles that we used back in the 70s. Thanks.